Dracula, Chapter 21, Dr. Seward's Diary, 3rd of October. Let me put down with earnest all that has happened, as well as I can remember it, since last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness I must proceed. When I came to Renfield's room I found him lying upon the floor, and his left side glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injury. There seemed none of that unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargical sanity. As the face was exposed I could see it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood had originated. The attendant who was kneeling beside the body said to me as he turned him over, I think, sir, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the old side of his face are paralyzed. How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered, and his brows were gathered in as he spoke. I can't understand the two things. He can mark his face like that by beating his old head on the ground. Saw a young woman do it once at the Everson Asylum before anyone could lay hands upon her. I suppose he might have broke his back by falling out of bed, but he got in at an awkward kink. But for the life of me, I can't imagine how the two things occur at once. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head, and if his head was like that before the fall, there would be marks of it. I then spoke to him. Go to Dr. Van Helsing. Ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him without further an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor in his dressing gown and slippers appeared, when he saw Renfield upon the ground. He looked keenly at him for a moment, and then turned to me. I think he recognized my thoughts in my eyes, for he said very quietly, manifested for the ears of the attendant, Oh, a sad accident. You will need very careful watching and much attention. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain, I shall in a few minutes join you. The patient was now breathing strenuously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary clarity, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking, and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked upon the patient he whispered to me, Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him when we become conscious, after the operation. So I spoke. That will do now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had better go upon your rounds. Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know instantly if there be anything unusual anywhere. The man withdrew, and he went into a strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The true injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extending right up through the mortar area. The professor thought for a moment and spoke. We must reduce the pressure and get back to normal conditions as far as can be. The rapidity of the suffusion shows the temporal stature of his injury. The whole mortar error seems affected. The suffusion of the brain will increase quickly, so we must trephine at once, or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping upon the door. I went over and found, in the corridor without, Arthur and Quincy, in pajamas and slippers, the former then spoke. I heard your man call up Van Helsing and tell of him an accident. So I woke Quincy, or rather, called for him, as he was not asleep. Things are moving much too quickly, and too strangely for sound sleep of any of us of these times. I have been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We will have to look back and forward a little more than we have. May we come in? I nodded and held the door open till they had entered. Then I closed it once more behind them. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient and noted the horrible pool upon the floor, he spoke softly. My God, what has happened to him? The poor, poor devil. I told him briefly and added that we expected he would recover consciousness after this operation. For a short time at all events, he went out at once and sat down upon the edge of the bed, with Cole Doming beside him.
We all watched in patience. We shall wait, said Van Helsing, just long enough to fix the best spot for trepreening, so that we must quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, for it is evident that the hemorrhaging is increasing. The minutes during which we waited passed with a fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking within my heart, and from Van Helsing's face I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words that Van Hel that Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think, but the conviction of what was coming was upon me, as I have read of men who have heard the deathly watch. This poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then would follow a prolonged strain of his breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Inured as I was to sick beds and death, this suspense grew, and it grew deep upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temples sounded like blows from a hammer. The silence finally became agonizing. I looked at my companions, one after the other, and saw that their flushed faces and damp brows, that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all as though overhead some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He could die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed upon mine. His face was sternly spoke as he spoke. There is no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be there is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word, he made the operation, and for a few moments the breathing continued to be strenuous. Then there came a breathing so prolonged that it seemed as though it would tear open his own chest, and his eyes opened. He became fixed upon a wild, helpless stare. This was continued for a few moments, and it softly softened into glad surprise, and from his lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so, he spoke. I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the waistcoat. I'll have a terrible dream, and it's left me so weak I cannot move. What is wrong with my face? It feels swollen, and it smarts so undreadfully. He tried to turn his head, but even that effort seemed to make his eyes grow glassy again, so I gently pushed him back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet and grave turn, Tell us your dream, Renfield. As he heard the voice, his face brightened through its mutilation, and he spoke. Oh, that is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is for you to be here. Uh, Could you give me some water? My lips are dry. I'll try to tell you. I dreamed. He stopped and seemed to be fainting. I called quietly to Quincy. The brandy. It is in my study. Quick. He flew and returned quickly with a glass, the decanter of brandy and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injured brain had been working in the interval from when he was quite conscious he looked at me piercingly, in an agonized confusion which I shall never forget, and spoke. I must not deceive myself. It, it was no dream. It was grim reality. His eyes roved around the room as they caught sight of the two figures, sitting patiently upon the edge of the bed. If I were not sure already, I would know from them. For an instant his eyes closed not with pain or with sleep, but voluntarily, as though he were bringing all of his facilities to bear. When he opened them again, hurriedly, and with more energy than he had yet displayed. Quick, doctor, quick. I'm dying. I feel that I have a few minutes, and that I must go back deep to death, or worse. Wet my lips with the brandy again. I have something I must say before I die. Or before my crushed brain dies, it how? Thank you. 
<clears throat> it was that night after you left me, when I implored you let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for my tongue was tied, but I was sane then, except in the way as I am now. I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Then there came a certain peace to me. My brain seemed to cool again, and I realised where I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine, gripping it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Sir Renfield proceeded. He came out of the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before. He was solid then, not a ghost, and his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth. Short white teeth glittered in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the betel trees to where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he warned all along. And he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? Oh. I'm making them happen. Just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining. Great big fat ones with steel and sapphire upon their wings. Moths in the night. With skull and crossbones in the back. Van Helsing nodded to him as he whispered to me unconsciously. The arachnophorus of the sphinxes, what you call the death head's moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, billions of them, every one alive, and dogs to eat them. Cats, too. All lives. All red blood. Years of life in it. And not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. And when then the dogs howled, way beyond the dark trees in his house, he beckoned me to the window. I got up and looked out. He raised his hands and seemed to call out without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame of fire. Then he moved the mist to the right and to the left, and I could see thousands of rats with their eyes blazing reds like his, only smaller. He held up his hand, and they stopped, and I thought as though he was saying, All these lies will I give you, and many more, and greater, through countless ages, if you will fall down and worship me. Then a red cloud, like the colour of blood, seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash, and sat in him, come in, Lord and Master. The rats were all gone, but he slid into the room through the sash, that was only open at each a wide just as the moon herself often come in through the tawny a crack, and stood before me in all her size and splendour. His voice was weaker, so I moistened his lips with the brandy again. He continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval, for his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, when Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on. Do not interrupt him. He cannot go back and maybe he could not proceed at all if once he lost the thread of his thought. All that I waited to hear from him. He did not send me anything, not even a blowfly. And when the moon got up, I was angry, and he slid into the window, though it was shut. He didn't even knock. I got mad with him. He sneered, and his white face looked out the mist with his red eyes gleaming. He went on as though he owned the whole place. And I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he wouldn't buy me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that somehow, 
Miss Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting upon the bed stood up and came over standing behind him so that he could not see them, but where they could hear better. They were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. When Miss Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she walked the same. It was like tea after the teapot had been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word, and he went on. I don't know that she was here till she spoke. She didn't look the same. I don't care for pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them. There's it all seemed to run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away I began to think. It made me mad to know he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered, as I did, but he remained otherwise still. When he came to know I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was mad, I told him, anyhow, I resolved to use all my power. I ain't he felt it too. He had to come out of a mist to struggle with me. I held tight. I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life. And I saw his eyes. They burned into me. My strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me. There was a red cloud before me, noise like thunder. Miss seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, his breath more strenuous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the worst now, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night. But lose no time. There is not an instant to spare. There is no need to put out our fear, nay, our conviction into words. We shared them in common. <laughs> we all hurried and take from the rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and so we met in the corridor. He pointed to them significantly as he said, They never leave me, and they shall not till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friend. It is no common enemy that we deal with. Alas, alas, that poor dear Madame Mina should suffer. He stopped. His voice was breaking, and I did not know if rage or terror predominated in his heart. Outside the harker door we paused. Art and Quincy held back and the latter spoke. Should we disturb her? We must, said Van Helsing grimly. If the door be locked, I shall break it. May it not frighten her terribly? It is unusual to break into a lady's room. Van Helsing then spoke quite solemnly. You are always right, but this is between life and death. All chambers are alike to the doctor, and even were they not, they are all as one to me. Friend John, when I turn this handle, if the door does not open, put your shoulder down and shove. You too, my friends. Now. He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it, and with a crash it burst, and we almost fell headlong into the room. The professor did actually fall. I saw her across him as we gathered himself up from her hands and knees. But what I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles upon the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker. His face was flushed, and he was breathing heavily, as though deep within a stupor. Kneeling upon the near edge of the bed, Facing outwards was the white-clad figure of his wife, and by her side stood a tall, thin man, clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw, we recognized the Count. In every way, even to the scar upon his forehead, 
With his left hand, he held both Miss Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white neck dress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare breast, which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk and compelling it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with a devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered upon the edges, and his white, sharp teeth. Behind his full lips of the blood-dripping mouth, champed together like those of a mad wild beast. With a wrench, which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height, he turned, and he sprang at us. But by this time the professor had gained his feet, and was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wa wafer. The Count suddenly stopped just as poor Lucy had done outside of the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further back he cowered, as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed, as a great black cloud sailed across the sky, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapor. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, with which the recoil from its bursting open had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing Art and I moved forward to Mr. Hark, Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream, so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seemed to me now that it will ring into my ears till my dying day. For a few seconds she lay in her helpless attitude, with disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat tickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. She put before her face her poor crushed hands, which bore on their whiteness the red marks of the Count's terrible grip. And from behind them came a low and desolate wail, which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an instant and despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing then whispered to me, Jonathan is in a stupor, such as we know the vampire can produce. We can do nothing with poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers with herself. I must wake him. He dipped the end of a towel in cold water, and with it began to flick him upon the face, his wife all the while holding her face between her hands and sobbing in a way that was quite heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moon sign, and as I looked, I could see Quincy Morse run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this, but at that instant... I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness and turned to the bed. On his face, as there might well be, was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few moments. And turned to him with her arm, seemed to her for a moment. His wife was aroused then by his quick moment. And turned to him, her arms stretched out as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again, and putting her elbows together, held her hands before her face, and shuddered till the bed beneath her shook. "'In God's name, what does this mean?' Arker cried out. "'Dr. Seward, Dr. Van Helsing, what is it? What has happened? What is wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? What does this blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this?' Rising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together— "'Good God, help us, help her, help her!' With a quick movement he jumped from the bed, began to pull upon his clothes. All the man in him awake at the need, 
for instant exertion. "'What has happened? Tell me all about it,' he cried without pausing. "'Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina. I know. Oh, do something to save her. "'I cannot have gone too far yet. Guard her while I look for him!' "'His wife, though her terror and horror and distress, saw some danger to him, "'instantly forgot her own grief. She seized hold of him and cried out, "'No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough tonight. "'God knows, without the dread of his harming you, you must stay with me. "'Stay with our friends who will watch over you.' Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and he, yielding to her, she pulled him sight in sitting onto the bed and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his little golden crucifix and said with wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear. We are here. And whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for tonight. We must be calm and take counsel together. She shuddered and was silent, holding down her head upon her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white night robe was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and where the thin open wound upon her neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back with a low wail and whispered amidst choking slobs, Unclean, unclean. I must touch him or kiss him no more. Oh, that it should be that it is I who am now his worst enemy and whom he have most cause to fear. To this he spoke out resolutely. Nonsense, Mina. It is a shame to me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you. I shall not hear it of you. My God, judge me by my deserts, and punish me with more bitter suffering than even in this hour, if he by any act or will of mine anything ever come between us. He put out his arms, and folded them her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that pinked damply over his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while, her sobs became less frequent and more faint, and when he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness, that I felt tired, his nervous power to the outmost. And now, Dr. Seward, tell me about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been. I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness. His nostrils twitched, and his eyes blazed, as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrible position, with her mouth to the open wound upon his breast. It interested me even upon that moment to see that whilst the face of the white set passion were convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly, lovingly stroked the ruffled, stroke her ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincy and Godalming knocked upon the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean if we were to take advantage of the coming to divert, if possible, the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other and from themselves. So on nodding acquiescence to him, we asked them what they had seen or done, to which Lord Godalming answered. I could not see him anywhere within the passage. Or in any of our rooms. I looked upon the study, but though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however, he stopped suddenly, looking upon the poor drooping figure upon the bed. Van Helsing then spoke gravely. Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope now is in knowing all. Tell freely. So Art went on. He had been there, and though it could have only been for a few seconds, he made rare hay out of the place. All the manuscript had been burned. Blue flames were flickering amongst the white ashes. The cylinders of your phonograph, too, were thrown upon the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. 
Thank God there's a copy in the safe. His face lit for a moment, then I fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs then, but could see no sign of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace there except... Again he paused. Go on, said Harker hoarsely. As he bowed his head and moistened his lips with his tongue, he added, Except that the poor fellow is dead. Miss Harker raised her head. Looking from one to the other of us, she said solemnly, God's will be done. I could not be feel that art was keeping back something, but as I took with it with, with the purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, And you, friend Quincy, have you any to tell? A little, he answered. It may be much eventually, but at present I can't quite say. I thought it well to know, if possible, where the Count would go when he left the house, for I did not see him, but I saw a bat rise from Winfield's window. It flapped westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfix, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east and dawn is close, and we must work tomorrow. He said the letter words through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes there was silence. I could fancy that I could hear the sound of our hearts beating. And Van Helsing then spoke, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Hawker's head. And now, Madam Mina, poor oh dear, dear Madam Mina, tell us what has happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained, but it is needed that we know. For now, more than ever... "'has all work to be done quickly and sharply and in deadly earnest. "'The day is close to us that we must end all. "'If it may so be, now is the chance that we may live and learn.' <laughs> "'The poor dear lady shivered, "'and I could see the tensions of her nerves as she clasped her hands "'and her husband close to her. "'She bent her head lower and lower, still upon his breast. "'Then she raised her head proudly, held out one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his, and after stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband, who held his other arm around her protectingly. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she then began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it did not act. I seemed to become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd in upon my mind, all of them connected with death, vampires, with blood, and pain, and trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned as she turned and said lovingly, Do not fret, dear. You must be brave and strong. Help me through this horrible task. If you only knew what an effort it is for me to tell this fearful thing at all, you would understand how much I do need your help. I saw. I must try to help up the medicine to its work with my will. If it has to do me any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remembered no more. Jonathan came in, but he had not waked me, for he lay by my side when next I remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed, but I forget now if you know of this. You will find it in my diary, which I will show you later. I felt the same vague terror, which came to me before, the same sense of some presence. <laughs> I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught, and not me. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then, indeed, my heart sank within me, for beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the very mist, or rather, as if the mist had turned into him, for it had entirely disappeared, stood a tall, thin man, dressed in black. I knew at once from the description of the others, that waxen face, that aquiline nose, on which the light fell in thin white line, his parted red lips, 
with the sharp white teeth showing between, and the red eyes that I had seemed to see in the sunset on the window of St. Mary's Church at Wilby. I know, too, the red scar on his forehead, where Jonathan had struck him. For an instant my mind stood still, and I would have screamed out, only that I was paralyzed. In the pause he spoke in a sort of keen, cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall take him, and dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was appalled and was too bewildered to do or say anything. <laughs> With a mocking smile, he placed a hand upon my shoulder, and holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First, a little refreshment, to reward my exertions. You may as well be quiet. It is not the first time, or the second, that your veins have appeared at my first. I was bewildered, Strangely enough, I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it was part of the horrible curse that such is, when his touch is upon his victim. Oh, my God! My God, pity me! He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder, looking at him pityingly, as if he were the injured one, and went on. I felt my strength fading away and I was in a half-swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away, and I saw it drip with fresh blood. The remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped, and would have sunk below and down but for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she pulled herself up and went on, and he spoke to me mockingly. And so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me, frustrate me in my designs. You know now, and they know in part already, and will know in full before long what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home, whilst they play wits against me. "'against me who has commanded nations, "'and intrigued for them, and fought for them, hundreds of years before they were born. "'I was countermining them, "'and you, their best beloved one, "'are now to me, flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood, "'kin of my kin, my bountiful vine-press, "'for a while, and shall be later on my companion and my helper.' You shall be avenged in turn, for not one of them but shall minister to your needs. But as yet you are to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me. Now you shall come to my call, when my brain says come. To you, you shall cross land or sea to do my bidding. And to that end, this. With that he pulled open his shirt, and with his long sharp nails opened a vein upon his breast. When the blood began to pour, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound, so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of them. My God, my God, what have I done? What have I done to deserve such fate? I who have tried to walk in meekness and righteousness, God pity me, look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril. In mercy pity those to whom she is dear. She began to rub her lips as though to cleanse him from the pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken. Everything became more and more clear. Harker was still and quiet. But over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a grey look, which deepened into the morning. Till when first red streak of the coming shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within call the unhappy pair till we can meet together and arrange about taking some action. Of this I am sure, the sunrise today, on no more miserable a house in all the great round of our daily routine.